Where is the image to make you click? Where is the content to keep you hooked? Behold, I show you the YouTuber. He is that clickbait. He is that madness. You need something that makes people go, <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck did he say in that video? What the fuck? I need to know. How did we get from Nietzsche to Mr. Beast? I tried myself at writing an intro to this, but I just don't know where to start. What started out as advertising really can't be called advertising anymore. It turned into behavior modification. Blackmailing with money? Go f yourself. I honestly don't know how to preface this. It's just too insane. It's weird. I can perfectly picture what I'm filming by just looking at the camera and then putting myself through the lens of the camera while making content. It, I can do it at the same time. What the f did he say? It's just interesting because like my retention brain and I'm like running all those calculations in the background. Within seconds, you have a new forecast, forecast, forecast. Your brain's like a neural net. And like if you consume enough viral videos and good content that you just kind of start to like train your brain to like see these patterns, patterns, patterns. It's just too much and it's way too dark. How did we get from Nietzsche to Mr. Beast? Well, let's find out. Both Nietzsche and Mr. Beast are artists. So the first question I asked myself was, what kind of tools are they using? Since Nietzsche wrote in the late 19th century, obviously a lot has happened since then. In the 21st century, computers amalgamated the radio, camera and TV screen into a single tool connected to the internet, fundamentally altering humanity's relationship with the word. We could even argue that it brought it back to its primal source. This technology not only virtualized written and spoken words, but also body language and democratized its representation. Everyone can now record or stream live videos of themselves, effectively decentralizing holistic, embodied self-expression. However, the digital age has introduced a profound paradox. While it has given us unparalleled freedom of expression in terms of content production, the algorithms governing content distribution on social media platforms have played a pivotal role in shaping our identities by determining which content rises to the top of the attention hierarchy. Significantly, they have prioritized images and videos over text, which is why we can say that, whereas the Gutenberg revolution propelled the written word to the top of human attention, the internet revolution placed the video on the throne and by direct extension, the human body. Okay, so one of the key observations here is that Mr. Beast is the product of a technological revolution, the democratization of digital video production. In the last video on this channel, we saw how Nietzsche was also a consequence of a technological innovation, namely the Gutenberg Press. However, we will see a clear inversion in the creative focus of artists on a general level in the 20th century compared to Nietzsche's work, which will ultimately manifest itself most drastically in Mr. Beast. Extending this comparison of the Gutenberg revolution with the transformation in consciousness brought about by the internet, we can detect a clear difference in the motivation governing content creation then versus now. Simply put, self-expression has shifted from creating what we authentically like ourselves to creating content that others like. But the reasons for this are a bit more complicated. As we have seen before, the democratization of writing enabled individuals to express themselves like they really felt they had to. People were free to say what they want, culminating in Nietzsche's dramatic proclamation of the death of God and the Ubermensch as his successor. Where is the lightning to lick you with its tongue? Where is the madness with which you should be cleansed? Behold, I show you the Superman. He is this lightning. He is this madness. The Gutenberg Revolution decentralizes the consumption of the written word, right? Mass production of books means mass literacy. Basically, everyone learns to read in the 19th century. Everyone learns to write. The complete decentralization of writing and the simultaneous decline of religious authority over the written word, over the creative usage of language, empowers the individual to create their own god. The shift of power over human identity, from the concentration within the church to the individual, facilitated by the technological decentralization of the creative use of language, culminates dramatically about half a millennium later in Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. This book can be seen as a modern scripture, Nietzsche's New Testament, introducing the successor to Jesus Christ, the Übermensch, which means overman or superman. 
Here's one of the core differences between Nietzsche and Mr. Beast. Nietzsche created from within with no clear target audience in mind. Thus spake Zarathustra, his opus magnum, was literally introduced with the words for everyone and no one. And throughout his writing, Nietzsche kept referring to his readers as the free spirits of the future. In some sense, he wasn't even addressing anyone alive at the time of his writing. We could therefore say that Nietzsche's work was merely governed by his own conscience, his inner voice or, or his internal God, if you will. As we will see, this internal locus of creative motivation will become ever more externalized after him and in Mr. Beast it will reach its climax where creative motivation is purely governed by external incentives. In the 20th century, a strange interplay between individual freedom and the power of the collective took place. On one hand, we saw the advancement of individualism particularly in Western societies, where ideas about personal freedom, individual rights, and self-expression gained prominence. Philosophical and cultural movements, such as existentialism and the counterculture of the 1960s, emphasized the importance of personal autonomy and authenticity. The technological advancements and economic prosperity of the post-World War II period also contributed to a sense of individual empowerment. On the other hand, the 20th century was marked by significant mass movements and collectivist ideologies. It witnessed the rise of totalitarian regimes like fascism and communism, which often subordinated individual rights to the needs of the state or the collective. Mass media including radio and television, played a crucial role in shaping public opinion and mobilizing large groups of people for political and social causes. Let's pause here for a moment and acknowledge that freedom of speech is a scarce good. It's really important to bear in mind that Nietzsche wrote at a time when he no longer experienced censorship by the church and not yet by the state. Otherwise, it would have been very hard for him to be merely governed by his inner voice, right? Additionally, his lifestyle was that of a social outcast, essentially completely disconnected from society, further feeding the devil-may-care character of his writing. Ironically, the right to freely express oneself spread in the West throughout the 20th century, yet it became ever more controlled by something other than church or state authority. Mass media also started to determine the value of art and literature in a revolutionary way. Whereas great artists in the past, like Leonardo da Vinci, for example, would be hired by the church, city-states, wealthy merchants or noble lords, art in the 20th century would be mass-produced. The selection criteria of what would be produced, or more importantly, distributed, would no longer be quality, as in the eye of the individual beholder, but its revenue potential. In a way, we can say that during the time of the Gutenberg Revolution, artists, intellectuals and poets alike pursued their own self-interest in the spirit of authenticity. However, in the 20th century, this motivation shifted from internally perceived self-interest to monetary interest. Artistic production became governed by the spirit of capitalism. Fast forward to the age of Netflix and we no longer watch movies and shows which some individual writer or director perceive to be of true creative value to themselves, but that which Netflix has ordered based on a careful market analysis. The utility function which you may know from Economics 101 became the poetic imperative of the media. It doesn't matter if content is authentic, what matters is that it sells. Netflix, which launched its streaming service in 2007, led the way in using data to choose what content to make and who to serve it up to. For Netflix, everything you do on the platform is a data point. And so with this data, they know what people like. They therefore know what to commission. The availability of big data sets has made it much easier for creators of all kinds to determine what kind of content is going to be popular. We identify 19 variables that really drive film performance and move the needle. Within 20 seconds, the AI is able to provide you with a very detailed risk-weighted forecast for box office, home video and TV numbers. The beauty of it is you can go back, change any input and within seconds you have a new forecast. At this point I have to apologize to all of you. The guy you just saw who wants to essentially trap us in a world of 
eternal copies of copies of copies without original, that guy is German. Since the media are mass media, what sells the most is that which appeals to the most people, that which resonates with the smallest common denominator of the entire Netflix population. Our most primal motivations, fears and desires, sex, violence, excess of all kinds and, most importantly, money itself. Money, that which separates the haves from the have-nots. Now, this is probably the worm at the core of today's media. Because content has to sell, because content is made to be sold, it must be optimized for its commercial value. There's no way around it. Commercial value of content, its revenue potential, increases the more the content is tailored to some kind of basic common denominator of the entire Netflix or YouTube audience. Otherwise, content will not scale. But because you cannot really specify the revenue potential of a movie or a show unless you compare it to previously successful productions, you reproduce that which has been successful in the past. And what is that? Well, that which has resonated with basic human psychology on the broadest possible level. This is part of the reason why there are so many shows which are kind of like Breaking Bad. Ozark is only one of the most well-known copies, but there are tons of drug-related drama shows on Netflix now. Ironically, however, Breaking Bad itself is just a remake. It's an American version of Dostoevsky's 1866 Crime and Punishment. Actually, both these works are fundamentally Nietzschean in that the protagonists act based on the assumption that God is dead, meaning there will be no final judgment upon death and therefore anything goes. Raskolnikov and Walter White both test out the meaning of living in a post-Christian world and try to show the viewer that they themselves may cross previously unbreakable moral laws if they were in a similar situation. It's kind of terrifying to see how the global audience seems to embrace this Joker philosophy of everyone is just one bad day way of lunacy, but well, the resonance of these kind of stories makes me wonder if people are more in touch with their dark side or at least want to get in touch with it rather than their good side. We live in a world which is neither governed by the platonic idea of the good nor the Nietzschean will to self-transformation, but in a world where money sits at the top of the motivational pyramid. Therefore, everyone obsesses about money. In part because money is that which could alleviate suffering for most people. Debt, hospital bills, tuition fees, housing, and so on and so forth. Money can satisfy basic human needs and money can satisfy grand human desires. Money, in some sense, is an omnipotent god, and everybody wants to get close to that god. Some videos will give away a million dollars, some videos will give away half a million. There's no difference whether I put 500k or a million. There is a certain point where a dollar amount is just a large dollar amount to an average human, average human. And so I think that point is 100k. Like anything above 100k, the average human is just like, that's a lot of money. The average human is just like, that's a lot of money. To some extent, the early internet was a space for authenticity as well. Small communities thrived on individually designed websites and even early social networks like MySpace granted its users plenty of freedom to express themselves as they saw fit. Indeed, Palo Alto's startup culture was profoundly shaped by the ideals of the hippie community. It was anti-corporate, anti-state and anti-religion. In a way, the early internet was anti-sincerity. Authenticity, in the form of the individual's freedom to express themselves, was the highest good. Advertisement, the very definition of profilicity, was seen as toxic. However, with the absorption of platforms like Facebook, Twitter and YouTube into corporate entities, economic motivations took over the internet. Here, too, money became the highest organizing principle, governing individual attention hierarchies, people's media feed. Contrary to the business model of centralized streaming platforms like Netflix or Amazon Prime, the primary revenue stream of platforms hosting user-created content results from monetizing people's attention by delivering user-targeted advertisements. Since content creators produce content for free and content viewers watch it for free, someone else has to pay the bills of the platform. This renders platforms like YouTube attention brokers between those who create content and those who pay for it. 
advertisers. In the beginning, it was cute. Like with the very earliest Google, <laughs> um, the ads really were kind of ads. They would be like, you know, your local dentist or something. But there's this thing called Moore's Law that makes the computers more and more efficient and cheaper. Their algorithms get better. We actually like have universities where people study them and they get better and better. And the customers and other Uh, entities who use these systems just got more and more experience and got cleverer and cleverer. And what started out as advertising really can't be called advertising anymore. It turned into behavior modification. Behavior modification. With the absorption of Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube into corporate entities, these platforms have been incentivized to prioritize content, which captivates attention. They've enlisted behavioral psychologists and neurologists to unravel the secrets of attention, resulting in the online content creator economy being summed up as make them click and keep them watching. If people don't <coughs> click, they don't watch. So you, you want to give them something to click. Take a thousand thumbnails and see if like there's a correlation to the brightness of the thumbnail to how many views it got. Basically, there are ways you can kind of see like the most viewed videos on YouTube every day and stuff like that. I just kind of consume those every single day and I've been doing that for way too many years. And you just start to notice patterns like the thumbnails on the most viewed videos or videos that go super viral tend to be clear, tend to not have much clutter, tend to be pretty simple. Titles tend to be less than 50 characters. Intros tend to be this. Stories tend to be this. And you just kind of like, after you see those thousands and then tens of thousands of times, it just starts to click in your head. Like, this is what it looks like, you know? This is very interesting. Mr. Beast is sitting at the top of the YouTube attention hierarchy. But how? Essentially by creating videos which maximize two variables, the click-through rate and average view duration. These two variables are that which the YouTube algorithm values above all, given that YouTube is a profit-generating machine which defines the value of a video solely by its ability to capture and retain attention in order to maximize the number of ads YouTube can show to the viewer in order to generate revenue. Bear in mind, YouTube is not meant to deliver value to you, but to its paying customers. The thumbnail and title have to be maximally impactful in order to trigger engagement. You know, on thumbnail set expectations. Like what you're saying is like, I like bananas. And what you need is, bananas are the best goddamn food on the planet. You need something that makes people go, <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck did he say in that video? What the fuck? I need to know. <laughs> On the other hand, average view duration is the average time a video is able to keep the viewer's attention. At the very beginning of the video, to minimize drop-off, you want to assure them that those expectations are being met. If you're putting a million Orbeez in a pool, don't start the video with you shopping for you know your mom's birthday present. At the beginning of the video, just say, This is 100 million Orbeez. We're gonna fill this pool and this entire backyard with them. Match the expectations, and then you want to exceed them. So you want to assure people that what they clicked on is what they're getting, and then blow their mind and be like, but you're also getting even more. Maximally valuable videos are therefore those which capture and retain attention at scale. This in turn incentivizes content creators to aim for the smallest common denominator of human psychology and perception, which effectively inverts the Maslow motivational pyramid. In this spirit, Attention is captured by means of visual and linguistic signals triggering the most primal instincts and attention is then retained by means of a hypnotic content structure. Anytime you say the word algorithm, just replace it with audience. The algorithm didn't like that video. No, the audience didn't like that video. If I wasn't retaining a viewer, just would it make sense for you to promote it? Why would you promote a 10 minute video that people watch on average a minute and a half? What seems to work above all, at least for Mr. Beast, are survival related videos and competitions with large cash prizes. The fear of loss and the desire to gain something of immense value, money, seem to be universally attractive motives, similar to how music videos tend to feature the same universally attractive motives over and over again. Now I said that YouTube is not meant to deliver value to you and yet here I am pretending to deliver value to you, which seems contradictory, right? This is so because beyond the inversion of the Maslow pyramid at scale, YouTube also motivates niche content for small communities, interest communities, we could say. While Mr. Beast is the universal attention king of YouTube, there are many particular attention kings for very specific individual attention hierarchies. 
But before you celebrate YouTube as a haven for individualism, think about this. Optimizing content for a small subset of subjective preferences leads to an atomization of the total YouTube network into very, very small communities without any content which could unite them in a shared meta narrative. And you may argue that that's okay, but well, what's of more value than that which unites people? It cannot be that which divides people into echo chambers on the one hand, and it can also not be content of zero moral value on the other hand, can it? So here's the irony of 21st century media. Unlike religious or political media, neither Nietzsche's individualism nor capitalism motivates media which can unite people underneath a shared value structure. The only thing we seem to agree upon at scale is that video beats text in the media landscape. In part, of course, because video is capable of attracting attention more effectively. Images in motion are closer to reality than static symbols on a white background, after all. It's just interesting, because like my retention brain, when you talk about something, I'm instantly like, hmm, what value are they gonna get? How many of them are gonna be interested? What percentage of people do I think will lose? And I'm like running all those calculations in the background, and that whole conversation, like the long, anyway, it's just something I can't turn off. My like bells are like, error, error, <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> Your brain's like a, you know, like a, a neural net. And like, if you consume enough viral videos and enough good content that you just kind of start to like train your brain to like see it and see these patterns that happen in all these viral videos. And so that anytime I watch a video or a movie or anything, I just can't stop thinking about what is optimal. And so it's like, it gives me a headache sometimes when I watch something too slow or I don't think is optimal. Obviously my taste isn't the end all be all, um, but that's something that kind of torments me, if that makes any sense. Yet there are other factors at play in attracting and retaining eyeballs. Popularity is a major one because people naturally gravitate toward what others value. This is akin to observing children playing. Their preferences aren't necessarily based on intrinsic qualities, but on what their peers possess. In essence, values are socially constructed to some extent. This is where the concept of profilicity emerges powerfully. Individuals started shaping their online identities on corporation-governed social media platforms based on how they anticipated others would value them. As a consequence, people learn to create not just content they authentically enjoy sharing, like pictures of their cats or their favorite cocktail recipes, but also to shape their own virtual personas, taking into account how they would be perceived. This is how online identity became a product of second-order observation. It's just interesting because like my retention brain, when you talk about something, I'm instantly like, hmm, what value are they going to get? How many of them are going to be interested? What percentage of people do I think will lose? And I'm like running all those calculations in the background. This is how online identity became a product of second order observation, shifting one's self-perception from the inner world to how the outer world subjectively perceives oneself marking a mass transition from authenticity to profilicity on a global scale. It's weird. I can perfectly picture what I'm filming by just looking at the camera and then putting myself through the lens of the camera while making content. It, I can do it at the same time. So you're like real-time editing In my the head. video. Yeah, yeah. That's something that didn't at the start come natural to me, but in the last probably like five years, it, it's happened. And so I would say it's one of my greatest strengths, but I don't know how I developed it. But anytime I'm filming anything, like it's almost like the like right side of my brain, I just can just look at it and I see exactly what I'm filming and I can just picture it. Well, it's probably do, recording the video, being the talent for the video, and then watching the editing and like analyzing it carefully and do that over and over yeah, and, you over, do and that over and over. You 10, develop 10,000 times, yeah. You do the editing more than the being in front of the camera. So you, you start to see yourself from that third person perspective. In an ironic twist, in the 21st century, words liberated from the oppression of the church and tyrannical state control in the Western Hemisphere found themselves subjected to algorithms designed to exploit the most primitive psychological biases of the human mind for the sake of capturing people's attention in order to generate profits from advertisement. 
This transformation also limited freedom of speech, as platforms are threatened by advertisers with their withdrawal if certain content rises in collective attention but does not align with the values embodied by the corporations paying for the platform. Uh, Adpocalypse, you know, and a lot of creators' revenue plummets because people are, are doing videos that advertisers don't deem acceptable and then now all these big advertisers are pulling and the little guys are getting hit and because ad rates dropped by 30% and the person who just quit his job to go full-time content creation mm -hmm. now can't sustain it. This had been said online, there was all of the criticism, there was advertisers leaving, we talked to Bob Iger today. I hope today. they stop, don't advertise. You don't want them to advertise? No. How do you think then about the economics of, of X? Actually, what, what this advertising boycott is, uh, is, is gonna do, it's, it's gonna kill the company. And the whole world will know. As a result, there can be neither an authentic expression of an Ubermensch on Netflix nor on YouTube now. Centralized media platforms like Netflix favor representations that follow previous standards over originality, rendering all media productions retro. Centralized media platforms like YouTube, which distribute content produced through a decentralized creation process, prioritize content that aligns with their content policies, a collective moral code that an Ubermensch would challenge and seek to overthrow with their own values. Somewhat ironically, the Ubermensch, as Nietzsche envisioned him, that lightning to lick your tongue, that madness with which you could be cleansed, would be shadow banned in today's media, reported by viewers as emotionally harmful in a quasi-Sovietic process of censoring creative expression.